Hello. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our three other panelists. We have Greta Pudan, ex Google hey, and uh, regional meta lead at HGT Pool. Then we have Rainer Selvet, CTO of Ready Player Me, the leading nice. avatar platform for the metaverse. And then we have Petri Rajahalme, FOV Ventures, investing <laughs> in the builders of the metaverse. Coming right there in green sweater. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming. We'll wait for Petri to come up as well. Uh, but I'd really, uh, we already had nice intros, so I'd like to just kick off by, uh, by asking, uh, how do you define the metaverse? Whoa. And uh, actually, I'd offer my own definition first, and ah, then I'll thanks. see what people have to add. Uh, so the ones that have stuck with me um, over the years is first one is kind of the blending of the digital and the real world. So it doesn't matter which one you work in, play in, or where you own stuff. Uh, and the other one is, uh, well, then there is basically the metaverse built by, by the big corporations. And uh, how do you see the metaverse? Like, maybe Reiner, you'd like to start? Yeah, um, we basically see the metaverse is like not that, not a one application. It's, it's not that one B Corp that, you know, owns all the user information, the user attention. So we see like metaverse almost like a, a movement of building more in the open. Like it's not one thing. Um, and to compare it, for example, with you know, an existing metaverse such as, for example, Facebook, then Facebook already has like multiple apps. Like it has Instagram, it has WhatsApp, it has you know Messenger and the MetaQuest platform. And there's already like level of interoperability between those applications. You can put on a headset, you can log in with your Facebook account, and you can get access to your you know your uh, identity, your email. It's relatively basic. Your through the avatar. Um, but we want to bring the whole thing, this kind of interoperability, into into the uh, into the entire entirety of the web. So. It's like applications being built in a more open way into open standards, which ultimately leads to much, much better end user experiences and also much, um, much more healthier economy for, for creators to operate on the platform compared to, you know, 30% Apple tax on the App Store, 80% mm -hmm. or whatever it is for the, uh, for the meta, et cetera. So that's, it's like a movement of, of building more in the open. Got it. And Greta, what about you? You probably have more perspective into the what the big corporations think about it, who are building most, uh, who are building actually most of this hardware that we are, would be using to access the metaverse, at least uh, from the spatial internet perspective. Yeah, like I guess when we were uh, discussing a bit what is the metaverse overall, we, we were all like, okay, it's quite a wide topic. And how I'm usually trying to imagine it is that we have this physical world where we have different like services that we are used to receive and uh, habits how we interact with people and everything and like we're right now making the first steps how to have this virtual world and of course uh, it has become kind of a very big buzzword these days but at the same time uh, all the web free and everything that has kind of raised this topic that there can be actually vir virtual world that is uh, maybe taking some uh, habits and things that we're having in the physical world and we could use in the virtual world. But also for me, the interesting part is that how to build a virtual world there where things which are not uh, possible in the physical world and the experience that we can create there and how it's kind of the use cases and how it could enhance our lives. So it's more like a virtual world, as I would say, that we're building at the moment in quite the early st steps right now. And Petri, what's, what's your take as an investor? Um, so <clears throat> defining the metaverse is kind of a, a blessing and a curse for us. So in a way, uh, we have to kind of have a thesis that we're, we're working um, under, uh, kind of an, an umbrella. But at the same time, the metaverse is so undefined still that it's kind of giving us leeway to, <laughs> to kind of shoehorn almost everything under, under the metaverse. I mean, some people are saying that it's not a place, it's a, it's a time. It's a time when you're spending more, more time and getting more value out of the digital world in, instead of the real world. Um, someone's saying it's the, the internet built by game developers. Um, so for us, we, we don't want to add a, a specific definition to it. Uh, we just see it kind of as a, uh, an extension of today's, today's internet, maybe uh, a more spatial internet moving from laptops and mobiles to a more, more kind of spatial internet. And interoperability is definitely a key word for us. Um, it has to have kind of um, 
you have to have the ability to have persistent virtual worlds, whether they're in VR or AR or, or not immersed uh, at all at this point. But you have to be able to hop around from world to world, from verse to verse, if you want to. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it's probably also the biggest buzzword of the last year. So what, uh, what is, what is kind of real and, and what's hype around Metaverse? Maybe, Reinhard, you've seen this pretty closely by yeah, yeah. all the integrations um, you guys are doing. Yeah, I guess like the from our point of view, like interoperability and, and for for like real ownership of assets is probably the number one thing that's either uh, it's it's very much hype. Like you see a lot of NFT projects, a lot of you know movement in, in Web three that um, like you get these connections, but you don't don't get actual real utility in the metaverse. Like like what's so what's so different between you know, how we've operated before? Um, on the real side, you know, us as building a platform, we, we believe that one of the main vehicles for, for interoperability to happen is to actually build a, a cross-application avatar system. And we've been building Ready Player Me for the last two years, and the company has been around for, for eight years. And we've always brought uh, like identities into, or made interoperability of, uh, of identities between different applications possible. And nowadays, we see that a lot of brands want to be associated with the metaverse, which is there's a lot of hype around it. People just want to be called the metaverse. But at the same time, they also want to get, um, get to the real utility. And they see Ready Player Me as, as, as a way to achieve that. For example, we have you know, recently partnered up with Adidas to, uh, to bring their collection onto the Ready Player Me platform. And instantaneously, they get access of, of distribution into over 2,500 apps that we have on the platform. So the hype part is like people just want to be titled or attached to the metaverse because that's the hype thing that everyone's speaking about. But the real is there are already tools and, and, and networks out there like Ready Player Me that actually give the real utility of the, of the cosmetics um, to be accessible within the, within the metaverse. Mm -hmm. And Petri, what, you, you see a lot of pitch decks, I'm sure. What's the biggest kind of bull category, <laughs> if I can put it this way? Um, I mean, obviously, for the past six, eight months, um, there was a lot of, um, like, I wouldn't say bull, but like NFTs and blockchain uh, slapped on, to, like tokens slapped on like startups where it doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, mostly probably just because you could attract some, some crypto funds to, to invest in you uh, if you had some kind of tokenomics, uh, building liquidity earlier into, into the, the exit. Um, but I mean, going back to, to your, your point, Reiner, for example, the, the Adidas part is, is to me like is key. I mean, Nike bought Artifact who are doing like digital sneakers, basically. Um, so now you have the brands of Nike, you have Jumpman, and then you have Artifact as, as one of the key brands. So um, it is a lot of it is, it is a reality for commerce and, and retail and brands that they have to kind of think about it strategically. Um, I, I just saw a report that marketing agencies, 61% uh, are, are looking into how, how they or incorporate the metaverse into kind of what they're talking about with their clients. And obviously there's a lot of hypey things as well there. It's, a lot of it is campaigns. Uh, but a lot of it is just um, a significant shift in the culture of the, the future generations, how they are perceiving the brands, uh, how they're buying into that brand. And if they have uh, a physical aspect and a dig digital aspect, um, which is kind of uh, their representation in the metaverse, it's, it's going to be key to, to who's going to be the big leaders in, in different categories for the future generations. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So brands are real. and. Uh, and Reiner, do you also you, so you make avatars? I understand that, but then you also make do you also provide items then, uh, other than the avatar accessories? Or uh, you mean like items for like cosmetics and stuff? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean like uh, like uh, Nike or Adidas have shoes, but mm -hmm. then I don't know if I have a really cool stereo or a car or <laughs> yeah uh, the... yeah it's, it's difficult to attach a stereo to an to an avatar, but uh, like generally speaking, yeah, like we 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 see Ready for Me as a as a distribution vehicle into the metaverse, like stuff you can attach to a character. And you know, in gaming, that's how, how money is made. You, you sell cosmetic items. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Fortnite has made billions of dollars by just selling virtual outfits that give you no advantage in terms of gameplay. 
It's just you want to go to the metaverse, you want to flex with your items, like you want to show off your cool Adidas assets, etc. The same behavior carries over from the real world into the metaverse. And you know, generally speaking, we just see that more and more people spend time in virtual worlds. When Facebook would o- bought Oculus, we, we were sure that VR is going to be social. And people going, are going to be spending much more time in virtual worlds. Their eyeballs will be in the, in the virtual worlds. So now you suddenly need a representation of the, of the physical within the virtual. Um, yeah, and definitely it doesn't have to copy uh, the reality. I, I think it would, be, it would be kind of boring if we just go and, and copy it over, the, over, over reality into virtual. Like, reality is pretty cool. Like, it's, it's pretty high, high definition and stuff. Like, you don't want to just copy it over. Uh, you want to make it like cooler, you know, Adidas outfits are like completely crazy as well. You get a lot of people commenting that are like <laughs> complete shit, <laughs> you know, you could argue with that, but they also look something that you wouldn't like just access in the real world. Mm-hmm. And Greta, how do you see, like, you're probably quite familiar with the advertising market, like how do you see brands spending their money or has that, is it changing already or do we still need to wait for five years till we have these cool glasses worn by everyone? To be fair, like for me, whenever this uh, when this metaverse topic came up, it's something that in the e-commerce sector I've heard it already for years because those big brands and everybody's thinking of ways how to create those virtual ex- experiences to reach more of their audiences across the globe. And of course, in the gaming industry, it has been already a part of it, this virtual aspect for years already. So I think now it's more this uh, wider um, aspect of different industries using this virtual experience to create this kind of a virtual world. And of course, like when talking about hype and what's real and uh, not, then this is something that, first of all, in my opinion, actually, the hype is not necessarily a bad thing because in some sense it creates a bit of confusion and what's what's happening but at the same time it takes also curiosity because looking already today here how many people are here then you're curious to know what's happening and not so this is something that whenever a new thing is happening on the market you need people you need to educate them you need them to become interested in order to have this wider audience so i think in this aspect it's cool and what's real it's also that i think it's already more than seven years that we have had this vr vr headsets they're not comfortable at all they were super heavy but I know at, at there's like the big, big tech companies, they've had these school programs, for example, they were introducing what is VR headsets for the kids, like how to use those. Mm-hmm. And now like it's still like we're building on the technology to make it like convenient and comfortable and more like cost effective that we could actually have it into masses. So I think right now it's more in this idea stage of bringing these different ideas, seeing in which industry it could actually create more experiences, either it's in the entertainment field or actually like making real use cases, having the creators actually and people who are able to create those experiences and then presenting it to the people and making it more accessible. And uh, and yeah, like, um, I think these are the main things that, for me, it's not necessarily who is building in the space because there's so, so many aspects, the hardware aspect, the software aspect, and also like the audience in e-commerce is maybe that I've seen already a long time, but it's not that it's like widely known and it's usually a luxury for the bigger brands. But nowadays, it's like even smaller companies have it more accessible to create those experiences. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really changing a lot and hard, difficult to see what's real or not. But that necessarily, like, I don't see it as a bad side. Also, that this hype around that will actually like speed up this uh, like innovation in this sense. Yeah, and this, Petr, you look. No, I just want like what's real. What what we have seen for the past eighteen months is um, kids. Yes, but people of all ages are spending more and more time in these virtual worlds. I mean, you have the, the Travis Scott's concerts that were, were on, on Fortnite, Lil Nas X on, on Roblox. It's, it's a shift towards like these, these gaming platforms are entertaining more and more people to do more than game or, or play the, the game. So it's, you go out and, and hang around and, and watch a movie together or you just, uh, virtual fashion is something that we've seen um, a huge amount of interest in, exactly because of what you were saying, like you have your digital identity, you wanna kind of make it look as, as good as possible. And, and then where the, when it becomes interesting is kind of this fusion into the, the physical world as well. So you can kind of have your digital um, garments or accessories or whatever, and then how can you transition that and, and even start manufacturing that within kind of the, the physical space that we have. Mm-hmm. Can I just get a quick show of hand? How many people have a virtual reality headset at home? 
All right. It's decent. It's yeah. like 10, 15 percent. Probably it'll probably be a lot more in a few years, I expect, as they get lighter and there's more use cases. And uh, this, um, so there is this thing called pass through, or, or basically you have a headset on, but you see the real world through the cameras. So it's like an early version of a mixed reality, what we will have in future. And that will probably, because you'll see your real room and then you see digital objects inside it. So that'll, that'll probably be a killer, just, just making a personal uh, <laughs> uh, forecast here. But Petri, what other use cases do you see besides, we'll be talking about kind of brands, fashion, like avatars. Uh, what else can you do in, so basically, in the metaverse? So what, do you even need like this uh, glasses aspect? Maybe metaverse is just an online world that is interoperable. I mean, I'd say, I saw a pretty good picture. There was a kind of a Venn diagram. So you have um, one, one bubble is like immersive technology, so VR and AR. One bubble is Web3, and one is, is blockchain. And the metaverse kind of sits in the middle. So it has kind of elements of VR and AR, but it doesn't necessarily have to have. Like uh, a lot of the investments that we've made uh, for now, even though we're five, six years into investing in, in VR and AR, none of them are purely VR and AR companies, but they are companies that will benefit from the rise and major adoption of AR and VR in the coming years. So I, I think that's definitely something that we're expecting to see on the consumer side. Uh, now, if we're talking about the, the B2B aspect, for us, we, so we have these kind of three pillars. We, we expect the metaverse to affect the way we play, the way we work, and then the way we build these kind of tools, so the tooling side of right. building these applications. Um, like Microsoft, Satya Nadella is constantly talking about enterprise metaverse. Um, so that's kind of where the place where VR and AR already have a, a bigger impact on, on how you design your car uh, like remotely. Vario, the Finnish headset makers, they have the, all of the automotive industry almost as, as clients. And it's already a reality, like it was still built on top of clay models like to this day almost. And now you can have like high fidelity headsets, whether for Kia you're in, in Korea or, or Frankfurt, you can already hop in a meeting and actually have a high definition representation of a future car and work around it together. And it can be as, as like uh, complex as designing a car, but also like working together with your, your colleague on a whiteboard and kind of having that physical almost presence of working together side by side when you're uh, in, in lockdown or just remotely working in, in general. So the B2B side is, is for us a, a major impact as well. And what are some of your other predictions? I mean, anyone can take this. What will happen in the next, let's say, three years, two years? Like, which use cases do you see really rising up as, as being more popular? Or where do you see this going? Like overall, maybe I would say, I think there's so many use cases and uh, even use cases that we don't even think of right now. Like the way I'm seeing, uh, trying to approach like what is more real and not, I think it's always also related to the necessity. Like of, of course we hear again the big tech saying like it's the uh, future of work and how to enhance this one. It's because it's necessary right now in these days when we had this pandemic going on and everybody's spending so much time at work, like how to actually, you know, improve this. Is there a way how we can improve this? Then this gaming and e-commerce uh, industry that I was saying that this is something that it's just been happening already. So I expect this is ongoing, but they have kind of maybe even like a an edge, uh, an advantage, because they have been already having these experiences built up for, for pre even previous years. But then uh, for me, it's also interesting how it will relate to, you know, travel and tourism. Like not everybody can travel the world, but how to uh, make it or when you're uh, uh, logistics, uh, it's a big bottleneck these days, and how actually maybe these things could be improved. So I think it's all these areas where we see there's room of, for improvement, and the, if the technology gets more uh, affordable and everything, I think it can have different uh, use cases for sure. Any predictions from the, what Meta might be doing with all its tens of billions poured into 
Well, uh, each year. I think, like, uh, of course, the, it's very clear that uh, Meta has very strong plans with this uh, because there's very big bets in this, and they know there's the future. So for me, knowing that this, if uh, these big companies put this investment and uh, fought into it, there will be happening uh, s uh, some things. Of course, it's a very research and development heavy. So I wouldn't even expect that uh, we will see in one or two years like big metaverse world uh, happening parallel with the physical world. But I'm like, I'm sure there will be big uh, changes made. And like, of course, it's not something that they will share uh, maybe publicly before that. There's a lot of like testing needed. There's a lot of development, but uh, I'm quite optimistic that in a couple of years time, there will be, uh, they're improving those devices. That's the Oculus, of course, that we mentioned and everything, and then the use cases and everything. So I think it's step by step, they will make those announcements whenever something is actually available to share. And until then, I think it's more they're using this creating this hype and like idea stage of what it could be because they actually, what they also praise the role is to inspire people and smaller companies and everybody to actually go into this field and start testing and doing stuff. Uh, and like, uh, hopefully they will also be more open to actually have these collaborations that they're actually like telling to us. So I'm actually quite hopeful about uh, different uh, news in the coming years. Nice. And just maybe uh, to kind of level the field for the audience a bit, like every big tech company basically has their own plan with the metaverse. NVIDIA has like an omniverse, which correct, connects all factories and things. And uh, like Snap wants to put filters and brands, and they have their own glasses coming out. They're kind of the leaders there. Niantic, the maker of Pokemon, has their own glasses coming out. And they are probably the leaders in collecting the data around the world. So they'll be like another level, kind of like Google Maps, but a 3D map of the world, which is a really big deal. Uh, who will like control the data of that? And then you can enable a whole bunch of experiences. And there, yeah, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, everybody has like a, their own plan. Uh, so that's really cool. Any other use cases? Maybe Reiner, you want to mention? Or what yeah. do you see? Um, yeah, yeah, things I think going? like Metaverse in general is like a, such a complex problem to solve. It, it's, I would be very surprised it's going to be one company that actually builds the entire thing. Like there is, you know, avatars is, is one thing. And we're really like focused on the, on the infrastructure layer. And probably the companies that will be the most successful are the ones that are on the lowest level, like providing the, the pickaxes during Gold Rush, basically. Um, and we see avatars being just one of those, you know, ways to, to get into or providing tools into the ecosystem. Uh, but there's like so much more to be built. Uh, you know, Epic's building their own, uh, obviously their own Unreal Engine. Unity has their own engine, but there's still like no level of interoperability between those two engines. Like they can read some file formats, yes, but like there's no way to actually bring one environment to another. And I, I suppose Omniverse is, is a very similar scenario where it's a completely separate environment with their own rules, et cetera, that is not interoperable with, but interoperable with, the, with the other systems. Um, so I, I see more and more companies realize that this is not the way to actually build an open internet. And you know, most of software is actually open source in the world. So we believe that you know, metaverse software will be, will be the same, or at least that's what I hope for. And that's a good question, right? Because Zuckerberg is saying all the right things, but is he to be trusted? Because actually, as he's on the, basically on the stage talking about how open everything will be, and uh, I'm part of a, a VR startup making stuff for schools, educational stuff, and basically there's some heavy, like, uh, how do you put it, closing the tap on the account system, which is only basically good for end users, and they really kind of basically screwed over a bunch of companies in the world who were building stuff for businesses kind of semi-legally. Uh, so yeah, they are not as close maybe, or they might be doing sometimes quite the opposite of what they say. But I guess we don't really know. And, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about kind of drawing parallels with uh, how the mobile uh, operating system industry came to be, that basically we have the Apple and Android world now. Do we see the kind of, uh, where do we see the spatial internet developing? Is, it, is there gonna be Apple and meta headsets and then some open platform or what do you guys, any wild thoughts I mean, on that? It's, it's hard to predict. There's, if, if, if we think about the, um, the kind of future that we're looking at, uh, if we take kind of a, a helicopter view or a, a kind of not, not too granular view is there's a lot of trends within the metaverse that we, we hope will, will kind of emerge more and more. Um, it's the aforementioned interoperability, it's, it's open source, um, like, so that there's composability. Um, DAOs is, is a very interesting mm. kind of aspect of, of the metaverse or web pre, however you want to call it, but kind of DAOs and community-driven uh, companies. 
that's going to be um, like a major impact on on how companies and startups and, and products are actually going to be built or how you're going to work if you're uh, working under a DAO structure or whatever. So so if you're looking at, at the major trends within the metaverse, those are kind of something where if those come true, it is going to be possible to have smaller players like t working together to kind of uh, form synergies um, and compete against the, the big bad evil corpse, if you want to yeah. if you want to call them and you that. Can, you can see that succeeding as well with like Axie Infinity, for example, mm -hmm. you know, the I don't know exactly what the uh, actual platform fee that the Axie Infinity, the company takes. The, uh, I think it was like around 4%. Yeah, if I remember. 4%. It was relatively small, much, much, much smaller than you know, Apple would take. And although you know, it's, it's not a game changing, uh, you know, it, it definitely changes the way we think about um, gaming and play to earn. But just it's one example you know, in a very early days that a a, a platform or a game or a company can succeed even if their like take rate is much much smaller than than you know traditional uh, 30 40 50 percent and how do you talking about this like how do you see the creator economy going in general and on the, all the different platforms because I mean a, a company is at least a web two era company is kind of ideal goal is that you have a lot of people producing a lot of content using their tools for other people like Facebook like Instagram and then they just kind of Earn a bunch of money basically through advertising or otherwise. Like, do you see the creator economy? How do you see it evolving? And in which spaces it might it thrive first? Yeah, um, I, I think you know if you take traditionally gaming for example, then no one actually buys stuff in gaming. You just go to a Fortnite and you rent the asset. Like, you don't actually, I don't, you don't actually own it. Like, you own jump it. into a different game and you lose it. Uh, actually, just I think it was this Tuesday. The V bucks or the currency within Fortnite now is interoperable between Fortnite game themselves on the on the on the different platforms that Fortnite can be accessed. So even before that, you you couldn't like access the same amount of money you have in your wallet if you jump from iOS to PlayStation. Uh, we see that shifting around to the hands of users. So if users can actually not just you know um, rent the items within the game, but they can actually buy them and own them within their inventory. And again, coming back to interoperability, then that ultimately leads to much better end user experiences. And you know, there, it also opens up for, for new business models to emerge uh, in case the assets themselves become usable in, in other games. But is gaming, sorry, yeah? Greta. Yeah, like I'm, because for me, the creators and you know, all these different apps and everything, like, you know, because there's different parts of the whole virtual world and of the day that we can create this world, but if it's not accessible through those devices and everything. So who is building those? Then we put it into two parts. One, where there's data levers, layers, there's hardware, there's software. So everybody needs to build these ones. And then, of course, yeah, the creators need to create actually those worlds. And then we need the audience to actually go there. It needs to be affordable so people would go there. So there's all these different things which are kind of related. And of course, uh, I think the big tech, of course, has advantage in this because they have like the buckets to actually do it. And if they start to, but at the same time, this wave three that I mentioned already, that gives actually opportunities uh, for wider creators and companies to actually build something in this space. And of course, the big tech knows, and I think this is something that like, they understand that there's no point to kind of like fight it, it will happen. And this is something that's why I think they're kind of even a bit forced to take this open approach sooner or later. It depends, of course, but like everything. So from my side, like I think this will change because the creators who were creating things maybe right now in the physical world for the virtual worlds, but with the advancement of the device and the technology, uh, we need people to kind of change their skills in order to create those uh, uh, experiences and not like necessarily building a physical experience into virtual world, but creating a completely different experience. So this is also needs education for the creator side of it. But for me, it's like everything is related. Like you, it, what you create, it's dependent on the technology that's there and uh, what audience you're building it. So it's, I, I guess this one's, uh, it's a kind of the dependency it will, uh, we will find out how that will work. Yeah, what, what I'm excited about is kind of the next wave of NFTs. Because now you had this this kind of, it was all based on kind of JPEGs and, and the board apes, etc. But what I'm excited about is kind of how you built utility into those NFTs. And, and Can you give some examples of what kind of utility you could build? 
So basically, you can have different kinds. It can be just governance. It can be just so you, you have access to a, um, a token-gated environment, and, and that then you can have access to voting. And, and actually, um, that's the, the community side of it. So you can actually have an impact on, on what kind of decisions are made within, within that structure. It's like a uh, democracy of sorts. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But then it can be like music is, is a lot, is heavily impacted by, by NFTs uh, already. You can have like uh, artists making, making music like single drops and uh, ticketing is, is gonna be major impacted by, by NFTs and how you can kind of, it's not just the ticket anymore, your, your ticket stub that you, you can frame it, put it on your wall, but it, it can actually have uh, extra ac access to, to merchandising, can give you access to, to talking to, to the, the artists itself or whatever. So, so building actual utility into in NFTs is, is what's really exciting. So it sounds like the combination of these technologies is going to give birth to a bunch of use cases, right? NFTs, like... Uh, so you, you, I remember, Rainer, you were saying that you have a house of math, uh, website that basically is for math tutors, but then you can wear your dead mouse like hat when you're like taking a lesson or giving a lesson. And, and there's probably a lot of, with this interoperability, it provides a lot of ways to just take your things to apps, like to work environment, right. which may look really stupid, but they work there and they're fun. Right. But I also Better. think like for the NFT part, for me, it's interesting. It's uh, one side, it's like incentive, incentive for the people to kind of like, ha and also ownership, how it gives and the, how, what are the, and the utility part. So there's different ways how you can actually, you know, like have the use cases, but also with the creator part, which is interesting, you know, with the developers, when there was this blockchain technology coming, then some developers need to learn something. And I think the more we will have also this metaverse or this virtual experience, if we have even more creators needing to have this extra layer of skills that they need to develop. So these are also like how you incentivize people to build something with NFTs. Maybe there's another digital form of ownership in the future, but also like how those creators are uh, creating uh, this world. So these aspects, I think it will be also evolving on its own, even maybe in a couple of years time. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe right now, because you know you have some maybe some more interesting use cases around the uh, yeah, actually, avatar use. Yeah, mo most of the applications are actually um, like work applications or productivity. It's it's ah, so quite it's a, quite games. a big yeah quite a big uh, category is actually uh, productivity and you know being able to you know meet in VR is, is one of them. They just launched yesterday the the next version. Um, yeah, like wherever you need to have like a face-to-face -face interaction with people. And our main target currently is like venture-backed virtual worlds. You know, Somnium Space, for example, recently launched with uh, the portals, uh, also some web-based gaming experiences like the Nemesis, etc. Uh, but most of the like actual practical utility comes from uh, from the productivity applications where you can, uh, yeah, collaborate in in front of a whiteboard, basically. So it's real. Um, when yeah. we come back to the topic of the yeah. talk, so that's yeah. that's the okay. real part. Yeah. Productivity is real. I think there's another interesting layer to that building this world is, you know, one is necessity or like how to, you know, enhance our lives. But at the same time, it's also uh, nowadays, right? like it's another, of course, a use topic, but the depression and anxiety and, you know, all the space and how people can, the entertainment part, either you want to entertainment or you want some escape or like a peaceful environment or you need to work on your well-being and like also these kind of aspects that uh, the whole, for, for the whole like living or well-being. I think these use cases also, it's not only about improving a daily process to be more effective at work or, or socializing. Like, I think it's another layer of... Uh, that can be also improved and in the future, you know. Yeah, make, make work apps more fun as well. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and the main, like as a, I'm a pretty big VR user, so the big categories, as you might know, is uh, basically training and education that work really well, besides, uh, besides just gaming. Uh, there is, uh, fitness is really huge, like there's apps where you can box, do all kinds of exercise, cardio, and uh, then wellness, because you're really isolated in the space, but also it means that your state can be changed really quickly by just uh, the different imagery sounds and things you hear in like 3D space. And then the social apps, like playing disc golf with your friend or, or something like this is super fun and super easy. And uh, so there's, yeah, there's a number of things that go beyond, uh, and of course the working uh, that we mentioned as well. Yeah. Brainstorming together. Uh, and the healthcare and wellness sector as a whole has been uh, an early adopter of, of these technologies. And 
like it's it's coming from the the spatial element that you have like uh, you can use it for for speech therapy or or kind of rehabilitation um, and it's it's proven like there's clinical research about how effective it is how much more effective it is in VR than not using in, in VR for example uh, like pain relief it, it really actually works according to studies mm-hmm. um, and from kids to to uh, elderly people so it's it's kind of inclusive for for all all ages so so they've been a, an early adopter of these technologies and it, and it's really amazing what they've been doing I think it's cool to aspect also exactly the medicine part where you you can because we're nowadays we're also lacking skills in certain parts and you can't always people don't want to like allocate and everything but how to maybe use like VR technology and like have uh, like be educate people in the medicine part or uh, from the distance carry out some things uh, uh, airline industry that has been suffering a lot like this is uh, dealing with huge losses in the days like how to make uh, instruct those maybe repairs or something from the distance and everything like for me this is all related to the virtual space that combines this whole metaverse in the future okay and then we've been talking about the kind of the the periodic uses of uh, xr technologies if you will like you would be using it to work for a while but you wouldn't necessarily care to wear it all the time because why would you do you think there would ever be a time where you would have in in addition to your watch your f- phone, headphones, like maybe you have glasses on you, and what, like what would need to change for that? And do you think there will ever be a time where we would be walking around with these light glasses and kind of, or lenses or a thing in your head, like Neuralink? Like how do you, what do you think needs to happen for this to go mainstream think, and is there potential for that? I think we're gradually going towards that. I don't think we'll ever be in a, in a ready Matrix. player one. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Uh, type of uh, dystopia or utopia, however you want Ready to call it. Ready Player Two, actually, I think was more dystopian. Yeah, anyway. um, but so there's there's still a lot of uh, technical um, challenges to overcome. Like if you're talking about like AR glasses that everybody would wear, like power optics, like there's physical limitations mm-hmm. still. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think those will be overcome in five years, ten years, maybe. Um, and we're gradually getting there. Like Meta has the the smart glasses, which g- will get more like smarter and spar- smarter over time, and then will turn into some kind of AR AR glasses. So fully like having the, I mean, imagine you have uh, an infinite canvas around you if you want to have it. If if you can really like boost your productivity, so it is something to strive for. And obviously, there's challenges around ethics and and kind of. Uh, how do you want to limit getting access to your field of view um, as as you, you're wearing these on a daily basis? But these are just like everyday problems in, in developing new technologies. I think from my side also, like, I don't see a reason why I wouldn't wear VR glasses if it actually it's comfortable, like I can afford to buy them. It ha- actually helps me maybe to navigate when I'm driving, when I go somewhere, when I go shopping, it gives me some advice or something like if I if it will actually have the functionality and comfort for me. So, uh, But th- that's the thing, it will happen gradually because there's the privacy aspect, there's the t- technology aspect that it needs to be comfy, that's affordable, so everything. But to be fair, I think it's only like a matter of like how long it will take but at the end of the day if it's convenient enough for the people and it kind of gives them some extra benefit then I, I don't see why it wouldn't be used and of course there's like there are the usual devices that we're using and if you can uh, we can of course incorporate this as sensors but the, the glasses currently seems to be the best way to go but it can be different smaller uh, devices that we that we are using and with that will kind of transmit this information Right, and the and the progress that, for example, Quest has done over the over the last years is is incredible from from both software and and from hardware. The comfort is still like you know it, it's not it's not there yet for yeah. me. Like that's one of the main reasons I wouldn't wear a, a headset every day. But as far as you know, the technology goes with the hand tracking, with the uh, environment detection, and all of that, the the progress has been actually really amazing. I mean, hi- history shows that. <clears throat> Apple comes when the market is ready and they come with a with a with a product that everybody wants. So 
we're getting closer and closer to that moment. Yeah. I think they're warming up the audience right now with all this one. So <laughs> it's always next year, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Anything uh, else you guys would like to add as we're running out of time here? Maybe Anything I'll say, uh, hopefully in five years, we won't actually use the word metaverse anymore. Like nobody's using information superhighway anymore. So I just hope that it's going to blend into these. That's uh, a good one. The, the, the M word. Technology. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty good ending, I think. Uh, okay, thank you, everybody. Do we also do questions? Somebody with a microphone would know. Uh, one, yes. two. All there right. was uh, one question in Brella from Tom, and it says the following: What are two things we as a company can do to get ready for meta world? Which Metaverse? company? Just a company. Any company. I would say like be curious what's happening in this field like at the moment because you see there's a lot of like doubts and where where's the hype what's real and everything but like you don't know if you don't follow this t uh, theme and topic the more you go into this topic you will start to also make connections and understand what's happening so i think uh, this one and of course like just having this uh, thing thinking about your business model and also how it could relate into the virtual space like i think preparing uh, what are the different aspects that could be uh, brought into virtual world or how you could enhance the overall experience and it doesn't necessarily exactly need to be in a certain vertical and stuff so just educate yourself and feel constantly keep up to date and see what what would be the opportunities if you kind of break down a bit your business into different uh, services or solutions that you're currently building uh, build digital uh, twins of your product if you can uh, i have one thing yeah study study the use case of uh, Wolf 3D or Ready Player Me. Yeah, they're doing cool Appreciate stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> building the open. Like uh, the whole software ecosystem really benefits from individual contributors and companies building in the open. So if you have a piece of software that is not that crucial to your intellectual property, make it open and others can collaborate on it and actually everybody benefits. That's a nice one. One more question. We good? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Someone brave, quickly. We answered it all. We did? Good. OK, no, there's one. Bray one. <laughs> all right, hi. Um, my question is, do you see Metaverse as a new emerging thing? Or do you see any existing examples, such as games or platforms like Second Life, that were trying to accomplish things like this really early on as early examples of it? Um. I think the, probably the best example, and also a, a company that I think operates in a, in a nice way, is Roblox. Um, they're essentially building a, a massive economy of, of creator-driven content. And there's plenty of uh, you know, young kids even that are making millions on the platform. And the, the technology they're building out is actually very, like, uh, they're not building it open just yet, as far as I know. I'm sure they have some open source software as well. But the, the way they operate, the, the way they provide tooling first for the, for the creators, I think is a great example of, uh, of an emerging metaverse. And yeah, maybe Minecraft would be another one, and, and Fortnite uh, as well. But yeah, Roblox, I would say. Cool. Thanks, everyone.